Hi, I'm Jason Corey, and welcome to another episode of Talking Tech. I'm here with Chuck Spivota and Adam Clater. And as usual, we're going to cut through the fluff and talk about emerging technologies and how they're relevant in government. We're shooting today from Red Hat's North American Public Sector Headquarters here in McLean, Virginia. And with that said, Chuck, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi. Thanks, Jason. Chuck Spivota. I am the OpenShift Practice Lead for Public Sector. And I have about 10 years, oh, just north of 10 years development uh, under my belt. Great. Appreciate you joining us. Adam? Yep. Adam Clater, Chief Cloud Architect for Red Hat Public Sector. Been at Red Hat about six years, in the industry about 20. Great. Good. So, obviously, we're covering emerging technology uh, discussions here on Talking Tech. We've talked about uh, containers before. We've talked about microservices. Uh, today's show is dedicated specifically to security and standards. So, just real quick. Uh, if I'm an agency CIO, a bunch of my developers want to use things like container technology. Uh, from a security perspective, Adam, what are what are some things I should be thinking about as a CIO? Yeah, absolutely. So you want a container platform that's got a little bit of oomph behind it from an industry perspective. So what Red Hat realized several years ago as we saw the emergence of Docker as a, a containerization standard was that it was a really good fit with our technology, SE Linux, which we co-developed with the NSA. It's actually how we do multi-level security for our common criteria, EAL4 evaluations. Um, and so at that point, a uh, container is just another user land process uh, within the operating system. So if you trust Red Hat Enterprise Linux to run multiple process within your data processes within your data center today, you can trust it to run multiple containers as well. Got it. So if someone has a subscription to Red Hat Enterprise Linux, do they get access to Docker and like a secure registry or what, what exactly is Red Hat providing in that container ecosystem? Yeah, absolutely. So Red Hat provides uh, little d Docker, which is the Docker community version uh, with the operating system. Um, and it's actually conforms to the OCI spec, the Open Container Initiative specification. I was going to ask you about that. Uh, yeah. So thanks no, for bringing it up. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's a perfect segue on my behalf. Uh, and the OCI was really, you know, there was a little bit of community infighting of like, what's the standard going to be, who's it going to be, who's going to lead, and some of the big kids in the community got together like Red Hat, Intel, Microsoft, and said, hey, you know what, we think that containers are really, really important. They're going to be a paradigm shift for our industry of how we do things, but we also know that in order for standards to be successful, there needs to be a lot of cooperation. So we brought folks like Docker and CoreOS with Rocket to the table, and said, we're all going to work together on this, and they all agreed, and we all jumped in the pool together, um, and so now we have OCI, which is this great specification that you can say, well, I need to make sure that I'm buying a container engine that conforms to an OCI spec so that I can run any container format and not get locked into any one individual. It also helps that with when you have an open group like that managing the specification, governance becomes a little bit easier, right? You're not beholden to a single person or organization's view of the world. Got it. So the two major things I hear about a lot when I'm talking about container um, standards is uh, OCI, which you discussed, and then Cloud Native Computing Foundation. So Chuck, can you explain to the audience what Cloud Native Computing Foundation is and you know what Red Hat's role in, in it is today? Sure. So uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, also known as CNCF, uh, is the foundation that has several projects in it, including Kubernetes, uh, Prometheus, and I believe etcd now, um, and also other projects that are in what we call incubation, such as CRIO. And uh, what it is, is a bunch of companies who've come together, organizations and actual uh, uh, vendors of, of Kubernetes, so like OpenShift is, is enterprise-grade Kubernetes, you have CoreOS Tectonic, you have Google, uh, with their container engine, and then you have users like CERN and eBay and SAP and a few others in there that uh, basically shepherd the Kubernetes community along. Um, it's very open, uh, it is very active, and there's a lot of really cool type of uh, uh, community support around. So there's weekly meetings as around special interest groups of like performance interest groups or scaling interest groups or service brokerage interest, group, interest groups, et cetera. And um, it's a way to make the community you know, open, but at the same time provide it with the right level of technical direction from the community. Because the great thing about uh, Kubernetes and, and how all these companies are involved benefit, it is a serious community of innovation. And, and as, I, as I always talk about, it is hockey sticking in terms of, of, of what features and functions are coming to Kubernetes, and it's not driven by one company. It's not driven by one, one corporation. It is a way to future-proof any companies or any organization's investment into adopting Kubernetes because the market drives 
what those new features and functions are and drives them safely. Yeah. So most CIOs that I talk to in the government, you know, they hear things like you talked about, the projects like Kubernetes, projects like Docker, um, they, a lot of them are using Linux to some, in some capacity, but I think that security for them also means how am I going to take all these different disparate products and projects that have a role in this container ecosystem and deploy them securely in my environment. So Adam, can you tell us what Red Hat's trying to do to make that simpler uh, and, and really more risk adverse for a, a CIO. Yeah, absolutely. So in the same way Red Hat has for the last 15 years, the government's been trusting us to sort of shepherd those open source communities, but also take uh, the output of those communities, our contributions, other folks' contributions to those communities, and really package that up into a way that a government organization can use for a 10-year life cycle, right? So I buy Red Hat Enterprise Linux when 7.0 comes out, I can guarantee that I'm going to be able to use that operating system for the next 10 years. That means things like backporting security fixes, uh, hardware enablement, enablement of new technologies. And so we take that same perspective on things like container orchestration and containers themselves. So we'll take the current version of the OCI standard or, or the Docker standard um, and make sure that we're doing all that security backporting, enabling features for our specific customers that are a little bit different from what maybe the community users needs, um, and then support that as a runtime in a life cycle that really makes sense for a government project. Got it. And then Chuck, I know you're out in the field talking with clients. Like what, um, in terms of deploying these types of technologies at scale, what are you seeing these days out in the, in the market? So I generally see folks um, starting with, you know, little d Docker containers, right? So uh, developers, you know, say, hey, here's my container. Uh, I'm building a container, I'm going to go deploy an app, right? And they'll deploy on their laptop, they might even have a dev box, and uh, they'll put it out there. And they're building containers in the raw, and you'll hear me say that quite a bit. So they took something from Docker Hub, which anyone can really submit a container to, or a platform, I'm sorry, uh, a, a, anything with middleware in it, databases, et cetera, they'll bring it down, they'll run it as root, and then and they'll just say, oh, this is awesome, it's really easy, right? Um, but then as soon as they start scaling up in terms of not just one container, five, 50, 500, because it goes very quickly because they're so decomposed in, uh, in terms of some of these new applications they're building, but it, it is uh, kind of wild west out there, right? So what you download from Docker Hub um, is great for experimentation and a great boilerplate to start, but organizations need something safer. Organizations want to take something from Docker Hub and make sure it's signed and secure and has their agents on it and passes all their internal uh, you know, security, compliance, and accreditation checks and store it in a way um, in their cluster, in, or sorry, in their environment, which would be in OpenShift, our secure reg registry, that then uh, your frontline developer can say, hey, here's my app, go deploy it in this builder image, we call it, in this container that is completely certified and spec'd out by the powers that be in my organization. Yeah, and it's interesting you bring up registry because that came up in a prior episode. So I know you said there's OpenShift Container Platform has a registry. Yes. But what if as a user I don't want to necessarily use OpenShift? I just want a secure container registry. Is there anything Red Hat's doing in that uh, in that space? Yeah. So we've got uh, registry is going to be bundled with the satellite server. So if you're a current Red Hat satellite uh, consumer, you'll be able to get the registry there. And then of course we'll have the registry in OpenShift as well. But I think what Chuck is really outlining is this need for software where supply chain and management, how do you do that in a world where a developer can pull down anything from a Docker hub? That's a little bit scary. Um, but then how do you also lay some governance on top of that, right? So that you're enabling your developers to develop in a very agile, very rapid methodology, um, but still conforming to some of the SDLC standards that you've worked really hard on over the last 10 years. Uh, and that's sort of where we see us fitting together with our customers and the community, right? We're building the enterprise distribution that merges all those needs together. Great. You know, adding to that, you know, I mentioned earlier, I, I was a developer for about 10 years by trade. In fact, I still dabble in it quite a bit. And I remember back when I was at a consultancy, uh, we had built this big application, and we went to the, the production team and said, hey, what app server should we be using? And they said, just something that's JSR196 compliant, which basically was Glassfish or EAP or something else. So we, okay, we'll use Glassfish. We chose it, we went with it. We did all our development, we went to you know, cute testing and QA and everything, and then when we get to production, they got different groups says, hey, no, no, no. Glassfish is not approved by us. You must use JBoss EAP. And this is before we even, you know, worked at Red Hat. And so we're like, holy cow, now we have to kind of replatform on this app server. And so of course, 
The business users are saying, we've spent all this money to do it. We're not going to invest more. You need to accept this. So it's a fight between the guys who are actually maintaining the data center versus the business users who are signing the checks. And eventually they had to accept it. And they had to accept Glassfish, a, yet another middleware platform in their uh, uh, data center. Whereas with OpenShift, by keeping a centralized registry, by controlling it inside, had there not been, had, had there only been that, I could try to deploy in Glassfish, but guess what? It wasn't approved, it wasn't in the registry. So it would have stopped me before I wrote my first line of code. You have this sense of control and governance and security that enables developers to still innovate very rapidly, but at the same time, keeps it controlled so that through the whole software development lifecycle and pipeline, end to end, it's only deploying what has been approved and certified and accredited yep. by the approvers. Well guys, we're just about out of time, but I do want to thank Chuck and Adam. Appreciate you joining us for this episode. Uh, for anyone interested in further information on either the Open Com uh, Container Initiative or the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, we encourage you to visit their websites and get educated. You can also email us anytime at talkingtech at redhat.com. Uh, until next time, we'll see you again on the next episode of Talking Tech.